This episode of the Grappler Union Podcast is brought to you by BJJ Tees. Go to BJJTees.com, enter the promo code GRAPPLERUNION, and save 10% off all your jiu-jitsu apparel. Go to BJJTees.com today. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Strict Nine Jiu-Jitsu, makers of vintage-inspired tees, hoodies, and rash guards. Go to strict9.co, that's S-T-R-Y-C-H, the number nine, dot co, and use the promo code UNION at checkout to receive 20% off your online order. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Grappler Union Podcast. Paul Maloney alongside Anthony Zito. On this episode, we have Carlos Lemos Jr. in studio. Carlos is a fourth degree black belt under Master Carlos Gracie Jr. He's a former world champion, and he's the owner and head instructor at Gracie Baja Donners Grove. Enjoy. I need the six minutes. That's what happens in that six minutes. You told me we're using any technique that works. Never to limit myself to one style. Keep an open mind. We're not here to take part, we're here to take over. In order to become more peaceful, in order for you to become better and, and strategize your life. Live. Professor Carlos, welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes. So uh, we want to talk a lot about Gracie Baja. There's a lot to talk about, but you're Gracie Baja Donners Grove, mm-hmm. and uh, but you've you've opened many schools. Yeah. How many schools have you opened total? Man, like I'm involved directly or indirectly with the opening of over 18 schools. Wow. Teams uh, all over the world. All over the world. Yeah. Many in Europe because. Uh, Uh, in 2004, like late 2004, I moved to Europe. I did a little uh, gypsy life here and there. I was like, I want to find a place to to start a school and to continue my education. So eventually I went to England and that's where I did over there. I, I How old were you? I was in my early 20s. Early 20s, yeah. Yeah. So this was after you won the Worlds 2002. Yeah. And then you got silver 2003. Yeah. Then controversial silver in 2003. Controversial silver. <laughs> oh, controversial. Okay. <laughs> what, what was the controversy? The controversy was like... Uh, Here, put that mic a little bit closer. That's all. That's yeah, the, contr- the controversy was like uh, I had a foot lock on when the, the guy went to my back and, and placed a hook and the ref gave him points for that. But I had a foot lock cranking on it and uh that was the argument was that should that count points or not well back in the day did not i don't even know what the rules are right now in in regards to that but Mm -hmm. uh back in the day it wasn't so then like uh i went and i scored like uh, two takedowns in the match and uh, i got the points of one i didn't get the points for the other one and the match was over Oh, it was yeah. a good fight, good challenge, you know. Uh, Who was it against? Uh, Bibiano, Bibiano Fernandez. Great fight. Great guy, too. Yeah. 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 So uh, when did you start training? Uh, we were yeah, just we're... talking about that. Like, uh, I had on and off in jiu-jitsu, uh, but uh, started, like, uh, in the uh, winter break for you guys, for us. It was the summer break of... 1992 and uh and then uh, i was in a trip down to the south of brazil i was like just a little kid it was my first time out of my home with my surfing friends i went to surf in the south of brazil and you know with the uh, older guys my my mom knew the family and allowed me to go and then over there i i, I was introduced to jiu-jitsu i had like I resisted a lot to the idea of jiu-jitsu because I had a judo background, some kickboxing, so I didn't want to do jiu-jitsu. I, I thought I knew jiu-jitsu. I know judo, similar, right. yeah, ground, yeah. throws, whatever, you know, with the gi, but... Uh, well, back then, it was more like the stand-up was so... Rudimentary. Yeah, and you just th- thought that you were you could just knock someone out like there was nothing really to say that you couldn't you just you would train that kickboxing like i could just go up there and knock someone out i'm never gonna go to the ground it wasn't even a thing i never thought about it back then you know when i was training jeet kune do it was just like 
Yeah. Oh, why do I need to go to the ground? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna knock that guy out or kick him or, and not even think about the ground as yeah. much. Yeah. You know, you know the classes at Gracie Baja they have, we have takedowns in every class. Wow, good. You know, I like nice. that. And yeah. really, like the black belts, the higher belts at Gracie Baja. When I look at all the schools kind of on the plane, they have exceptional takedowns when you compare it to like the average in mm-hmm. terms of you know their just ability to you know rock your base wrestling everything and. You know, it starts from Professor Carlos. I mean, I think that the focus and injecting that into every you know class has been the most frustrating part of my yeah. Training. I think it should be in every class, though. Is, I mean, it, we're we're working on the ground here, but like we got to get it to the ground, right? Yeah. So yeah, like uh, Master Carlos. Uh, many people don't know, but he's also a black belt in judo, and uh, that that he inherited that obviously. His vision, it's pretty much Hall's, Hall's vision. He's a late brother, uh, Master Hall's Gracie. And uh, uh, his vision was always that we had to train judo. We had to have a, a general understanding of wrestling, you know, and we need to practice self-defense. When you're a kid and you just want to compete, a lot of these things don't click because it's so hard to learn judo and, you know, like... Uh, when I drift away from judo and then I, I became a jiu-jitsu animal, you know, was a jiu-jitsu kid. I didn't want to have anything to do with judo. I was, I used to do because he forced me to do, but I, I, I didn't want to train. And like, uh, when I, after becoming a black belt, I, I understood what he was trying to do back in the day, but it, it's more of his vision, you know, to, to be well-rounded and complete in our areas of jiu-jitsu. He doesn't believe in like uh, you, you're an, you're extremely. I mean, you can be an expert in a certain uh, aspect of jujitsu, but you need to to understand uh, the 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 the, heart, the art as a, a whole. Right. And like uh, a lot of people today, f- in uh, uh, are becoming experts in only one side of jujitsu. Oh, I want to be a competitor, so I just want to train this, or I want to be. A, a cage fighter and just going to train this and I, I don't need to to train with the gi or uh, I don't need to tra- to never take the gi off no man it's this is all jiu-jitsu I was being like this I, I, I think it's important that you 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 compete you you do some self-defense but you, we never drift away from what the, the founders of the arts, they really wanted for us. And we appreciate more of these things as, as we uh, age in the art, not necessarily like as you get old, but as you, when you get your black belt, you know, a lot of things that your teachers, they used to tell you, and you, you maybe you never really paid attention. They start to make a lot of sense to you, you know? It's like when you were a kid and your parents, they say so many things to you and eventually you, you you reach your adulthood and you say, man, you know what? That was right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. I think a lot of, a lot of people we interview, you know, the, the older generation of, you know, black belts, jujitsu, all have that fundamental judo background. And I'm seeing that like the newer black belts now are coming up without that, you know, that foundation of that judo. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, has, as a sport grows and jujitsu grows more and more, you know how the black belts are really going to change you know and and their training and then when they open a school and see if they're going to start introducing takedowns more and stuff like that uh because that's a whole i mean i'm i lack in takedowns i'm i'm a guard puller that's just you know it's a guard puller generation right now yeah yeah and that's this yeah, yeah right i'm a guard puller too right so you know it's something that you know it's interesting that you know to think about you know where the future is going to hold you know who's going to be holding the torch for that you know as the you know, older crowd goes away and then the younger generation comes in who are more in the MMA and sport aspect of it. And then the Olympics come, you know, so it'd be interesting. The curriculum is really great because it, it encompasses all facets of jiu-jitsu, something that it was like a pleasant surprise for me, you know. You're talking about Gracie Baja. Gracie Baja, okay. Downers Grove, you know, because we have the all levels class, which has self-defense kind of the first few moves you do, usually a takedown incorporated in there. Mm-hmm. You do some groundwork. It's it, very you know very basic jujitsu you know then you have the fundamentals class which is more uh kind of along the side of like the basic sport techniques also just basic jujitsu techniques and then you have the i mean you could probably give better explanation than me necessarily well this is my view of it 
and the advanced class, which is obviously, you know, sport jiu-jitsu, and there's a no-gi program, you know, there's just as much no-gi as there is gi, you know, it's pretty balanced in terms of, you know, not going too, uh, too much one right. way or the other, Yeah. and... Now, is that year-round, or do you do uh, more no-gi according to the seasons? No, like, uh, uh, the way Grace Baja designed its curriculum, it's all year-round, you know, okay. like, we... We have a schedule. Uh, it's a schedule in the in the weekly classes that we like. Some the we, here's the thing: when you have no students, it's impossible to start with multiple programs that you offer everything in the school. Yeah, exactly. So why don't you walk us through something like like when you open these schools up? There you have no students. What 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 do you do? Like because there's 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 you know, places out here that open up that are brand new and they've got just a bunch of white belts and now they got to figure out what we do, you know? Like, uh, my experience, you know, and from from what I learned to, from Master Carlos is that we, you you started with a BJJ All Levels class, uh -huh. okay? And uh, you teach them like a little bit of self-defense because that will help them to understand ground more. Uh, little takedowns, they can't obviously spar too much on their feet yet, you know, and uh, and then like uh, the, the basic jiu-jitsu techniques that everyone needs to know, like a smash pass, a scissor sweep, a butterfly sweep, an arm bar from the guard, a triangle choke, guillotine choke, you know, how to place a back mount, how to put a rear naked choke, like the... the, the, the uh, jiu-jitsu one-on-one. Yeah. And then uh, as your students start to progress, usually like on the third or fourth stripe, that's when we start to create new programs because right now you can, you have the three stripes. These are guys, they, they're, they endure like a good like uh, 10 months of training, sometimes more. And then these people, they, if they're over there, they want to compete many times. They want to they wanna, uh, pursue their, their jiu-jitsu path. That's when I started to create other programs. So I started, I created one class a week of no gi, and then two classes of advanced jujitsu for these intermediary students. And then I started to branch from there. But this is how we're pretty much doing most of the schools. Another great thing is uh, fr Friday nights we have study hall. Oh yeah, you can that, run like that three was, hours, four hours as long as you want to stay. That, that was a huge groundbreak for the school because here is what happens. Uh, back in the day, I used to teach, like when I first came to Chicago, I I went to a school in England. I was there for four and a half years. That's when I helped to open a lot of schools in Europe. When I came back from the UK to the States, I moved straight to Chicago. It was for a brief period of time in, in North Carolina. because I still have family and, and relatives over there, you know, and the... Uh, Triangle area in Raleigh. And uh, arriving in Chicago, I went to teach in a little school that uh, it's closed now in countryside. And over there, uh, we, th 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 there was absolutely no students at all. So obviously we had to mix the class up with, with, with uh, whichever would come. Right. You know, so we, we branched out the program in the very same fashion. It worked really well for the school while I was there, you know. Uh, and the same with the kids' program. You know, at the beginning, the kids, like, you mix the kids, bigger kids, smaller kids. But there is, a, like, a tremendous difference between being a jiu-jitsu instructor and a timekeeper. A lot of the... A lot of the... The, the jiu-jitsu instructors, they show a move. I mean, I'm not... Uh, 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 trying to 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 criticize anyone okay sure. guys but there are jiu-jitsu instructors out there they teach a class they put on the time they sit you know and then people get hurt because you don't have like someone to st stop you Supervise. when you get in yourself right. yeah. in trouble and uh when we when you create a structure program in your school you say okay back in countryside even though we created a structure I just want to train as much as I could. So 
a class that is supposed to finish within 90 minutes would go up to three hours. Okay, guys like him, like you, you would love that. Sure. But a guy with his wife waiting for him at home with a baby would hate jujitsu. Right. And a kid that had to go to college the next day and would miss a test would hate jujitsu. And there are dropouts, there are people sometimes getting hurt. And I, moving to downers, it was like a maturity uh, period for me when I understood, like, again, what Master Carlos was, was trying to do from day one, structuring the progress. Time to start, time to end. In Brazil, it wasn't like that. In Brazil, it was more like <laughs> you come at six, you leave when the school closes. Right. <laughs> you train as much as you want. Instructor gonna go there, would teach us one, two moves. You go, one of them black belts, senior black belts in Gracie Barra. I learned a lot from Professor Márcio Feitosa, who is a senior to me. Eventually, I started teaching in Grace Barra headquarters too, but it was pretty much like this. It was like a free will train. You could train as much as you want. Is that because they had, there's so many people there? It's because like uh, we don't have so much things to do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like right. you have like in a way, I felt like I had more time in Brazil than I had uh, that I have over here, guys. Right. I, man, I was in law school there. I was like uh, I was running my own like a uh, uh, yard of dogs in Brazil. I had a little farm with my dogs. I always loved. I was involved with that, and at the same time. I was like uh, teaching jujitsu twice a day and training at a work class level, you know, yeah. some, some, some way, somehow, like, I think the days over there are longer. Oh, I don't wow. know, like I feel. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So what, you were, what, like breeding dogs? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So law school and then breeding dogs and then teaching twice a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a full day. It's yeah. a full day. Yeah. And, yeah. and training too, man. Like yeah, I was yeah. competing at like the highest level. <laughs> But uh, that's the, that, that was a that was the major difference between, and then we come here and everyone has has to have a schedule. Yeah. So yeah. then you, you if you train too much, there is a segment of students that you are neglecting mm -hmm. the the people that have to wake up in the morning and and go to work and and go to their families and kiss their kids good night. Okay, so mm -hmm. you can't do that. You need to have the schedule. But how right. about the the guys that want to train more? Mm -hmm. Well. Let's give them open mats. So then they get into the, to the open mats and you have like a, a purple belt who's really eager to, to compete and to strive. And you get a, a, a white belt that has little experience and is out of shape. So then that person gets hurt. So then the other one gets hurt. So then the other one gets hurt. And next thing you know, like you have like three guys coming, three tough guys coming for your open mats. And a lot of people are, on the sidelines because they can't train. So yeah. what do you do? Well, you change the approach. And that's what we did in Downers. We create a study hall where people go there to share their experiences, their knowledge, their skills, but also to train. You have the guys that they go there and they for three for three hours, we have a lot of our tough guys. They, they just go one round after another. You know, you have people that they go and they exchange their experience, their moves just like we used to do in Brazil, because I think that was the greatest uh, 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 difference. What made us so good in Gracie Barra back home, it was the collective experience. Master Carlos, he wasn't that guy to come and your hand is here, your arm is there, your, no. He, he taught us a lot. And usually he used to teach us when we would screw up badly and do something really stupid and say, man, Come over here. How how can you do that? And then he would show you something, and teach. His classes were very basic, but he wasn't that guy. No, no, no. Your hand is here. Your head is there. Change your grip a little bit. No, this was uh, like usually the after training time that we used to sit together and say, "How did you catch me, mm. man? I catch I caught you like this. Okay. How did you pass my guard? Well, that's how I passed your guard." And that collective experience over the time produced like a dream, a dream team. Yeah. And and we we replicating that idea with downers with like with a method that people go there to practice, but not to get hurt. Yeah. So you have that three hours of free sparring. Besides the sparring lessons, I mean the sparring 
time you have throughout the week, but it's not sparring at free will. Like, and uh, you just drill. I mean, I was drilling. No, I, yeah, for I, an hour. Yesterday, I someone for an hour. Yesterday, like I maybe I spar for, um, I would say like maybe two rounds, but I did like an hour, an hour and a half of solid drills. Yeah. And I advised my students, and I coached then, and we exchanged ideas. So uh, uh, today I was pretty sore because I, I drilled so much yesterday, but it was enjoyable. Right. So how does it work with Gracie Baja coming from the top? There's a certain amount of things that is in the re required curriculum, and then there's a certain amount of time where the instructor can kind of do what he wants, things like study hall and stuff like that. Um, I mean, do you have to okay that with anyone, or do you just kind of run the gym how you want to run it? Yeah, this this is that that is a misconception about how Gracie Baja runs its programs. Uh, like the the problem is information. I think I think it's like this. Every time it's historically every time someone tried to incorporate something new in the jiu jitsu community, the 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 that that group or that person was criticized. Just uh, for years later to be to prove that that was the right way to go with things it, historically if you look back even like at the beginning it was like this you know and and it was from uh, Maida uh, 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 <laughs> telling the graces that they could never teach a known Japanese person to man uh, us like getting a, 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 a uh customized uniform right you know oh this will never will never work uh, it shouldn't be like this but uh they're like the, the I, because i i hear that from other people like i i, I talk to uh, instructors from other schools i have friends outside gracie Baja that sometimes they come to me in a tournament and say oh Right now, you you teaching like uh, 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 the men the menu of McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I say no. It's Master Carlos tell me. I, I mean, the curriculum that Master Carlos design tells uh -huh. me: teach a foot sweep, teach a guard pass, teach a submission from the side control. For instance, it's not necessarily like this. Okay, I can teach any foot sweep I want. Any switch sweep that worked for me or any switch sweep that I like my students to, to practice, I can teach any guard pass I want. I can teach any submission on the side control I want. Right. Where this is limiting my creativity. Only if you don't have jiu-jitsu to teach. Right. I, I mean, I, I believe I have a little bit of jiu-jitsu that I can teach different stuff within the curriculum. Right. But that's what he considered important for you to uh, have a have a, a well-rounded understanding of the art yeah i mean i don't think there's that i mean even the 10th planet system has a curriculum you know they have their you know warm-ups they call them and every school that's under 10th planet does these warm-ups and eddie bravo says okay this week it's a this week it's b or whatever and that's their curriculum you know per se and i and i know that lcct has a curriculum of theirs and you know there's nothing i think it's fine I mean, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that so why do people refer to it as mcdonald's of jujitsu then yeah it's odd it's an odd thing it's an odd thing man like uh because there's so many when, of them maybe it's the I, biggest I school is it the biggest school gracie baja yeah it's the, the biggest it's um, today's team. it's the biggest uh uh jujitsu entity in the world okay. and i believe it's one of the biggest martial arts organizations in the world today wow. but i think it's a lot of uh this information you know if you if you're not informed if you don't understand it's easier to you know i got like i i, I have this this uh, phrase that i quote often like i think one of the biggest problems in humanity isn't uh evil it's ignorance because ignorance it's the mother of evil you know when you don't understand something you you tend to reject and to oppose and, and to criticize and to try to kill that idea but when you if you try to understand it it makes sense to you uh i don't know i think it's because 
we are we all have a, a same standard in our schools and people think this killing diversity but i did I, I couldn't disagree more you know i think like uh no we give an identity to our students i think this is really important one of the things that kept grace Baha together was the sense of belonging that all of us had by being around master carlos you know, he made sure that Grace, the Grace Barra School was a very extension of his own family, and we want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be, we want to be part of that family of his. You know, so where, you know, his roots. So, Master Carlos was the son of Carlos, right? Mm -hmm. His older brother was um, Carlson. Now, Carlson he had a different idea of what he wanted his jiu-jitsu to be and how he passed along. So where does Carlos get, where does Master Carlos get his, like, that idea from? Is it something that he thought of? Because Holes was a little different as well, like how he approached because he would then do a lot of wrestling and stuff like that outside of jiu-jitsu. How, how, did, how did Carlos come up with his, like, idea of what he wanted to be for the family and everything like that? Man, I think, like, uh... uh a lot of Master Carlos's ideas, they they're 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 like a continuation of uh, of what Halls wants for okay. Jiu-Jitsu. You know, like uh, Halls was his biggest influence, his biggest like his uh, biggest inspiration, yeah. and uh, he was the the assistant instructor, the second in command of 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 Halls Grace Club. So when Halls died, the students they gathered together. And the uh, uh, Hall's wife, who is a uh, Hall's Junior's mother, like my my good brother, my, my really good friend, uh, Hall's and Igor's mother, she called Master Carlos and asked him, "Look, Carlinhos, we want you to to inherit the school, to take over, because the students they say it has to be you." So that's how everything started. That's that was the very birth of Gracie Barra. You know, and because he had such respect for Halls, that he never felt like, okay, what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna call myself Carlos Gracie. No, it's my my brother's school. So he moved to Baja and started calling the school Gracie Baja. You know, that's like the city it. of Baja. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that's where it came from. Yeah, and there are other funny stories too. When they when Carson opened the school in Copacabana, Halls shared the second floor with him. So Carson had like, a, for the most part, the first floor were the biggest mats and Halls the second floor. There are two jujitsu schools operating in the same building, completely different uh, uh, mindsets, completely different ideologies, you know? Really? So yeah, Carson <clears throat> was on the first floor, yeah. Halls was on the second floor. And why didn't they come together, do you think? Because they have different visions of what they want for jiu-jitsu, you know, like yes. Carson had like a, a very physical, I'm not saying bad, okay? There, there are times in jiu-jitsu, you all know, like you need to be physical, but mm -hmm. Carson had a very intense physical jiu-jitsu, Halls have a very technical approach and uh, uh, it just, they're different animals, they're sons of different mothers. You know, son, they're like half brothers, so they have like their different minds and. So uh, you know, Car uh, Holes and Carlos were sons of different mothers, or Carlson. No, Carlson and Holes were sons of different mothers, and uh, Carlos, Carlos Jr. and Holes were sons of different mothers. Okay. Yeah. Man, that, that someone needs to make a whole film. I know they'd have that Gracie and the Birth of Valley Tudo video, or a documentary, but they need to make like a, a series. series. Jeez. Yeah. Like it'd be incredible. It would be incredible. It would. But, okay, you want to hear a very interesting story yes. since you're a jet kondo practitioner? Uh, I heard that from a guy who who was a friend of Danny No Santo. And before Bruce Lee flight uh, uh to Hong Kong for his, the last movie he filmed, which I think was the Enter the Dragon. Mm -hmm. He he was like completely obsessed about ground fighting. He was training a lot of judo with the top judo players in America at that time. And uh, he comes to them right before 
he take off and says, then I, I have something I want to tell you, man. Like, uh, I think I'm becoming, I'm, I'm going, I'm getting to the, the end of my journey. It's, I'm really close to connect the missing link of everything I thought to be right in martial arts. Uh, I heard of this family in Brazil. They're incredible ground players. They're the best ground fighters in the world. And I think that's the most important element missing in martial arts. When I get back from, the, from filming the movie, I'm gonna fly straight to Brazil and I'm not gonna come back until I master that art. Damn, that's so, crazy. That's crazy because wow. he was a contemporary of uh, Hall's Gracie. So guys, imagine if this would ever yeah. happen. I know it's happening in the heavens now for sure oh, man. with no shadows of doubt, but imagine if Bruce Lee back in the day would get together with the Graces back in Brazil. He would be training with Master Carlos's older brother and, and that would, we would probably be see the UFC 40 years before right. they saw. And yeah. jiu-jitsu would have gone worldwide sooner. Absolutely. Because yeah. yeah. we incorporated in our Jeet Kune Do, we incorporated, and I think it was like 93, right after UFC won, they started saying, we got to do ground. Because at back then, it was like four ranges of fighting, they called it. Well, there was three, then there was four. So you had kicking, boxing, trapping, and then grappling. So that's how they, that's how their curriculum focused around. Yeah. I didn't like, once we started doing jiu-jitsu, because I, I was really little, yeah, I didn't like it too much. I got just smashed, and you know, I didn't really, <laughs> no, really, I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do. And it was guys hard. didn't know how to take it easy either. Yeah, no, yeah. no, it was it was all think about it, all white belts, even yeah. the instructor, right? Because no one really had a blue. I didn't even know what a blue was, you know. Yeah. And I do remember, um, I saw a poster, and I said this before on the podcast, but I saw a poster for what I thought his name was Rickson. Gracie, mm -hmm. I'm like, who's Rickson? I, I go, Who's oh, he's the, he's the brother of you know Royce. That's what we call him, yeah. Royce. He's the brother of the really good guy, exactly. Yeah. And he's that's what brother. we thought. <laughs> we thought that a brother. that this guy was like they're like, oh, we don't really want to go see him in a seminar. No, we want to see the other guy, the UFC guy, the champion. Fools, right. fool. I mean, you talk about the ignorance. We had no idea, yeah. but yeah, I missed out on that seminar. I don't know. It was the mid '90s. But oh, wow, yeah. It's, Imagine but, if you stuck with it, how good you'd be. <laughs> we'd be brothers right here. Yeah, you guys be brothers. In a way, we all are, you know, yeah. because uh, jujitsu really uh, remove boundaries and preconceptions we have as people. You know, we are we're segregated in so many different ways. It's not even funny. And like one amazing thing about jujitsu, it's like bring us all equally the same. You know. Uh, I think that's 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 the other thing I was just talking and uh, a lot of things with Gracie Bahar thought to be commercial, but they are not. You know the the whole movement of Jiu Jitsu for everyone as a slogan. People really think that has to do with a slogan to sell memberships, but guys, it's not. It was the old man. He believed that the world could be a better place if everyone would learn Jiu Jitsu just like as we were, st uh, as we were talking. Mm -hmm. And that was his idea. But we could not incorporate that at the beginning. First, we need to be accredited. We need to get the recognition that uh, to be organized and to fight and to win would bring to us as a Grace Baha team. And then we achieved that. So it's time to to service the community and to bring jiu-jitsu for everyone. I do believe like the communities, they have strong jiu-jitsu programs. You have less violence, less drugs, less alcohol, you know? So uh, I think like uh, all jiu-jitsu, all the jiu-jitsu instructors, they, they have their responsibility with their local communities, you know, to improve the quality of uh, people's lives in, in that community, you know? We do, we do things from time to time in the owners. We just did like a, a, a martial arts marathon day open to the community with several clinics open to the public. They could come train 
you know, with no compromises of whatsoever, just to enlighten people that there are options of lifestyle out there, right. and, you know, they, and they can benefit from it. We had a SWAT team officer there, third degree black belt. He was showing how to <laughs> defend guns. Guy has a gun pointed into your head. How do you defend it? And like you kind of cut an angle and you pull it from like the top. Oh wow! <laughs> gun, but it was real like quick. That's scary. Oh, yeah. That's like, scary. Get back! Get back! He <laughs> takes the gun. We just had we just had two of our our teammates got held up. Wow! Well, yeah, they got robbed. Uh, Where Chicago? Uh, yeah, Chicago. 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 Yeah. Last Whoa. last weekend, um, a bunch of the guys from the team went to go watch the Holly Holm cyborg fight Oof. at uh, out, out some outpost or out, something like that. Out, Point or something like that. Yeah. It's on Wood Street and Grand, I think, just a bar in the city. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they got wow. robbed, robbed at gunpoint uh, walking home. Yeah, they wow. took their phones, jackets, wallets. Yeah. Wow. And that night that of the Holly Home fight, it was like negative 15 out. Right. They took their jackets too. Yeah, they just pulled up in a car. I suppose, I guess they were scoping them out. They drove past and they were scoping them out and they came back around and Cisco was like, hey, you know, I think something. And then Sure, you know it. The car came back around. Three teenagers. Three te their teens. Yeah. Three teens came out and said, what are they saying, Paul? It was actually kind of mild for uh, a robber. If, <laughs> if I ever have to get robbed, this is the way I would like to be robbed. Right. Because, you know, you would, you imagine a kid with a gun and his hand shaking and him yelling and, you know, but they just rolled up and flashed the gun and said, hey, don't get shot today, man. Give me your stuff. Right. And it was that simple. Right. It's freaky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, what do you do? To, to, just to have that, as a young kid, to have that amount of poise. Right. With a gun as a 16-year-old, you know. To, hey, man, give me your stuff. Come on. Well, it's probably not their first time, obviously. Right. You know, they're, they're pretty but efficient at it. Pretty pretty cool under pressure. They probably and, they be, threw, and they threw everything away. Oh, really? Like, they, he found his, because I guess the Google Android phones are pretty pretty damn good. Because uh, he was able to like find his phone, like see where it went and trace the steps to where it landed and found his wallet. And yeah, so they left the credit cards because you know you'll get picked up if mm -hmm. you use them, and they left the phones because you could trace the phones. They, so just they wanted the cash. the cash and the jackets, cash and jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ, no microchips in those. Yeah, no, what a life, really. It's yeah. sad. It's yeah. sad that like people get to that point of desperation. Oh yeah, they have to do that. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I think jujitsu. It's it's the response for a lot of problems in the world today. I agree. Guys. You know, I totally agree. Yeah. I have like a, I have this idea like, uh, maybe I've been so influenced by Master Carlos that a lot of my ideas they're they're also his ideas. He had this idea of like an alternative community. He tried that back in the nineties which was his father's idea to have like a like a, a training center away from the big cities in a sort of like a self-sustainable like organic you plant your own food uh you train judo you train wrestling you train jujitsu all you do is training you have like you eat only greasy diets you train two three times a day you eat help with the the, the 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 tasks and sleep nothing else that that was his I, idea yeah. he started that project back in the mountains in brazil in for, for troubled uh teens no, for, no, for people everybody. who wants to commit but i okay. i think like um when i managed to to retire and i mean when i get less busy it's something that I would like to get involved with in a social pro project like that for, for troubled kids. You know? Self-sustained jujitsu compound. Yeah. How about that, Cito? Yeah. That's how it was back in the day, right? That's yeah. where they... Yeah, they had like a proper professional right. operation. Right? Right. Like, now, the Gracie diet, are you on the Gracie diet? Uh, I do the combinations. Okay. But uh, I'm not strictly on Gracie diet foods, but I, I pretty much like being, been doing the Gracie diet combinations for more than 20 years like can you expand on like the, the whole gracie diet who came up with it and man it was uh it was uh great grandmaster uh carlos senior he he had some uh, stomach ulcers and uh he started researching uh he started getting more and more into phyt phytotherapy which is the medicine of herbs 
and uh, and uh, food combinations. There there are certain food combinations they 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 cause like a conflict of uh, di uh, digested enzymes in your system, and that drains energy from your body, and uh, it's essentially not good for you because it makes your body acid. When we should always strive to get our body to become alkaline, you know, and the acidity, it's, uh, it's known as to be one of the reasons of cancer, you know, so that, that was the, the whole idea. Like when we eat something really heavy, sometimes you feel like just, you need a nap, you need to right. sleep. Yeah. Well, if you're teaching nine classes a day, like I do sometimes in the week, I can't eat something really heavy because I don't have, I need to be alert i need to be enthusiastic i need to be happy on the mats i need to have energy to train with guys like him yeah. <laughs> so i can't be half that we have right. some wars yeah so yeah we, we uh, go at it round after round after round this yeah boom, so boom. uh that's how he came with a balanced diet where he combines certain foods and he doesn't combine certain foods mm -hmm. to not cause this conflicts and right. to have a easier digestion and and uh, to get more energy like you get that sense of like man i'm so tired because you got all the blood of your body going into your your digestive system it's the most complex uh uh uh, uh operations that goes around in your body so i remember reading the gracie diet book and really a lot of it what it talked about was I mean, this, this is kind of what sticks with me is like berries. You can only have one type of berry. Like pineapples were in that group that you can't combine with any other type of berry. But you could have watermelons with anything. You could have like guava with anything. You could have more neutral foods like apples. You could have that with anything. Yeah, like. And a lot of it was, you know, first, before you do any of that, like break some of your bad habits. Like, you know, you just cut down. It, you can be flexible with the diet. It gives you a little bit of leeway in terms of what. You know, combinations you want to do as long as you kind of adhere to them and you know i did that for a bit i stopped did it helped me lose weight but the book was very useful in terms you know, of just getting yeah. me on a healthy regimen mm -hmm. yeah I, I remember master carlos talking about three meals a day 20 years ago and when uh, all the the sports uh, uh nutrition guys and bodybuilders were talking about meals every two hours Otherwise, you would cut muscle mass. And right now, there are people that are doing like fasting and eating mm -hmm. like two to three times a day tops. And right, there are right. days they're not eating. Like uh, his dad used to do like every Sunday, which was a day of rest, rest, uh, no food of whatsoever, just fasting for 24 hours. Oh, wow. You know, uh, uh, no, nowadays a lot of people are talking uh, about the benefits of fasting so yeah. intermediate fasting yeah intermediate fasting, fasting. Yeah. intermediate fasting yeah uh, i mean i do that just because i don't eat a lot to begin with <laughs> i'm just a little but yeah. i don't you know eat a lot of food but yeah i only eat, you know twice a day you know that's just what i'm normal and i i train a lot you know and i'm totally feel fine when i train you know so i i, I see benefit in that as opposed to like you know going out and eating burgers and this and that and then ah, man you gotta burn that all off and then you're feeling you know lethargic like, yeah lethargic right i like going to train when i'm a little when i'm hungry like i'm just hungry no, but and, it yeah. has to be like this yeah. because like uh, if you think like uh uh when you train jujitsu obviously you're not there to kill anyone or to hurt anyone but uh uh, uh the, the what you're doing to your body it's very similar to what predators they they do out there in the in the wild you know you acting all your muscles it's endurance it's your heart rate goes over the ceiling sometimes yeah. and it's briefing it's dehydrating it's, it's a predatory act it is i mean you know very true yeah but uh to the pet predators they they hunt when their bellies are full absolutely not no you know they I, say I, your I, vision improves as a hunter even just a guy with a sniper rifle if your, your vision improves hungry. by like, I'm 10, pretty sure he doesn't wear glasses. Yeah, by ten percent, if if you're hungry, if you don't eat the night before or something like that, mm -hmm. isn't that interesting? Extremely interesting. I wonder yeah. what the optimal time 
to eat um, before training? Would it be t- two hours before, four hours before? I, I mean, if you, if you know you're training at 6 o'clock, wh- when do you eat? Uh, really, uh, like, I, I, if my lunch is early, sometimes my lunch is, like, right at, at 12.30. For me, it's early when I finish class. Uh, so then I, I snack just a little bit around 5-ish, but light. If my lunch is late, no, it's, I, I just have, like, a, a, a coffee and... I go to train, yeah, you know? and then I I eat. I try to eat as soon as I finish. You know what's incredible is I'll walk in and you know here's a professor. He's running a school. He's playing all these roles, and then when he's drilling, drilling like a savage, he's absolutely going like <laughs> boom, 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 just like what do you call the uchikomi for like uh, judo? Like just kind of set up a move, set up a move, just explosion, explosion, explosion. You're like man, this guy's like. Getting ready for the <laughs> intense, yeah. <laughs> but it's just like every day, kind of like normal training. And I, I try to keep up, and then he's got some sweat going, but I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> yeah. You have to be when you're the. Ins- they got better. You got to lead by instruction, right? By by example. I mean, by example. He's got to be the hardest worker. Sure. He's instruction in spades, but then just when push comes to shove, okay, let's time the drill, and then he's the one there. Boom, boom. It's like I remember going to Marcelo Garcia's school. He's doing all those warm ups with everyone. You know, like everyone's doing the hip escapes and everyone's doing the, you know, shrimps and whatever you're talking about. And I guess it's the same thing, hip escapes and shrimps. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, he was doing it with them. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And when the, when the engine stops, it rusts, you know, so I want to keep the engine running fresh. Right. You know, good. How? Well, you keep exercising that. Uh, I I don't believe like a, a heavy CrossFit regime or a heavy weights regime is good for you. I think that it's good in certain season, seasons. You do a little bit of that. You do a little bit of functional. But that is, people ask, ah, how can you? W- what is the best workout for jujitsu? Jujitsu, you know, I I believe in like a strong repetition regime. There are no secret techniques, guys. You all know that. Right. You're all jujitsu yeah. guys. It's just how many times you can repeat that. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things we incorporated recently in the Gracie Baja Downers Grove regime, too. Uh, we learned jujitsu as kids in Brazil. So there was no strength involved. When there is no strength involved, what do you do? You keep moving, transitions. You know that. Right. But. Uh, in America, a lot of your students, they're on their 30s and plus. So how can you teach then transitions if they're so strong? No, you can't because people will retain a move that they earn over there. Like, a, you got to take down, that's it. Mm-hmm. Or you got to pass, that's it. And it's natural. If you have strength, you use your strength. Well, you eliminate the element of strength by... Uh, 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 linking the moves together and then everyone can can create the muscle memory of transitions and that's what we are doing in downers now from the first to the last move we teach we connect them all together and we we go through rounds and rounds just repeating the same thing one person only and then we swap and the other person does it and uh, I we've been doing that only for a couple months and I can already see the improvements on our students. Wow. And wow. The, yeah, this has been really exciting. I think like somewhere in October, early October, uh, Carlos, Professor Carlos, he, uh, approached me and, you know, some of the techniques that I'll, I'll catch against people, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll always have like good conversations about it. And then, oh, where'd you learn that? Oh, you know, uh, the 10th Planet, and this guy, Josh Bassini or Omar, or one of these guys, or Eddie Bravo. I you know, just wanted some of these things. So he came up to me and he's like, I'm, I'm like, what do you think about these 10th planet warm-ups? It's just, it's just, you know, he's just curious. He's just asking about it, you know. And I'm like, you know, I, it's it's all out there. I can just send you a link or something. And, and then he's like, uh, yeah, I got. He's like, I have a million flows. Like he, he can just put together like right. just moves. Like I mean, you think about like how many moves he's got in his like right. arsenal, and then just combine them in the combinations. He can do like infinite just combinations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know so. This has been really exciting, kind of at the end of classes. Like, we'll have done the takedowns, we'll have done the groundwork, uh, little situational stuff, and then he'll say, okay, guys, we're going to do a flow now. 
and it very much is like its own warm up, tenth planet mm-hmm. warm up, and it's not the tenth planet warm up, right. you know, but it, it's like a flow that he's created that links our moves together. That okay, yeah, and, and do this, and let the guy take him out, and then he's gonna take you to the top, and right, right. break the guard I, open, get your feet on the hips. I'm, I'm a huge fan guard. of that. I'm a huge fan of that because you know I got back into jiu-jitsu. I was I was 39 when I got back into jiu-jitsu, so I wasn't in the best shape of my life, you know. Obviously, you know, so. Man, how old are you? 42. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's <laughs> young, <doesn't he? laughs> Jiu-jitsu, man. Yeah, I thought he was a teenager when I met him. <laughs> so, um, um, but if I would have, you know, started, started doing those warm-ups, it just got my body in the tune of, you know, moving a certain way that I'm never used to. I'm just, just walking around. You know, I'm just walking. I'm not twisting, getting bent, this and that. But that flow allows you to muscle memory and kind of see, oh, I, my body can do this. Oh, I can stretch there. I can, you know, kind of get your body used to that whole movement, you know, especially, you know, later on in, in your late 30s and stuff like that. I think it's it's a good idea, you know, just for the, the beginner. I didn't say, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, you should be doing that. Even in advanced class, we do it. Like be, I, think it's, I, think it's, it's I think it's just good, you know, once you understand the movements and that gets you there. You know? yeah, that's extremely important in in America because uh, people over here are naturally strong. It's not that we are not strong in Brazil, but you go to, uh, like I, I go every year to teach seminars in Japan. I have a, a good pool of friends over there and they, they own schools and I get invited to, to fly to Japan every year to teach there. And... Uh, when I get to Japan, I have some of my best sparring sessions. In every school I go, in every Gracie Baja school I go there, the, the, the skill level is tremendous. It's because they're smaller people in general. They, they're not so strong. So everyone has that natural flow. And that's why I think jujitsu was rediscovered by, by the Japanese and incorporated and, and absorbed, assimilated so fast. Mm. Today, like the, the jiu-jitsu level in Japan is incredible. They're so good. Mm. They're so good over there. And uh, every time I go there, it's, I challenge myself, you know, because it's amazing to train with them. I love it. You know, I can't get enough. Yeah. You know. I remember an Instagram and, story you put up where you, you had these judo guys doing setups, uchikomis, and they were just crisp. And you, you're commenting, it, look how good they are at what they're doing. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I think my mission is to, to educate people more than anything, you know, and to, to get them to, uh, that isn't a, a, the right age to learn jiu-jitsu. You know, there are the right methods to learn jiu-jitsu. I, I, I don't believe in the right age to learn jiu-jitsu. I had a student uh, back in Brazil. He was uh, like a smoker his whole life, he was a doctor, and uh, and he started jiu-jitsu in his late thirties. Wow, today he's fifty. He's on his fifties and he's in the best shape of his life. He's a black belt. He earns a lot of titles, and the guy looks like he's someone on his twenties. He haven't touched a cigarette, a cigarette since he started jiu-jitsu. So it's beautiful. Yeah. So in in 2003, you went over to Europe? No, 2004. 2003, Master Carlos sent me to Korea, to South Korea. It was a crazy adventure, like an incredible experience to me. (laughs) What what happened there? So you got to tell him that with Professor Marcos, like what happened? Like you landed? Oh, yeah. Was that 2003? No, no, that was when I was back in college in England, you know. It was a, it was a different situation. <laughs> what happened? Uh, what happened in Korea? In Korea was this man, like uh, Master Carlos comes to me and say, "Shkuhega, I want to send you to Korea." I say, "North or south?" Say, in a, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta ask that question. Yeah. That's like the first thing you gotta ask. <laughs> no, okay, okay, no okay. one can yeah, go okay. to the north, <laughs> even if you try. Like, it's a one-way ticket. You know, you know. Yeah, they, you can't get Jiu-jitsu out. Jiu-jitsu would liberate the people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't have that. You gotta teach Dennis Rodman. Get yeah. Dennis Rodman to learn, and then send yeah. him to North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's say, you know what it is? Koreans never seen jiu-jitsu before. They never seen a Brazilian in their whole lives. These guys are extremely interested in, in learn jiu-jitsu and 
it's our mission to spread that out there. I cannot send uh, Roger because look at his size. They will think that he's overcoming them because of his strength. I cannot send Rolizinho because Rolizinho is bigger than, even bigger than Roger. Flavio, all them guys, man, I gotta send you because you got to get the message delivered. They, they will believe in Jiu-Jitsu once they train with you. And then they, he, they sent a ticket which has a connection in, in uh, New York, but there was no, it was weird. Like my ticket never showed a connection in New York and I had a, like an expired visa, uh, uh, an expired tourist visa to the US. So when I board in the plane, they announced there was a connection in New York and I say, well, I don't have a visa. They say, don't worry, it's just uh, to refuel the, fl the plane. Right. But right then, like maybe week before, weeks before, there was a law approved by the, the Congress here that any foreigner uh, touching down in uh, American soil has to pass through immigration. So <laughs> when I get over there with more than 20 stamps coming and going from here and uh, so many tournaments I did, they, they say, man, what are you trying to do? I'm saying, I'm trying to go to Korea. They say, we're sending you back. Wow. So they, I was sent back on the first plane back to Brazil and it was like a, like a heartbreaking experience, you know, like was like terrible. You felt horrible. You felt like, what did I do wrong, right? right. And then uh, getting back in Brazil, we, I called the Koreans and I say, hey, you backfired guys. I'm sorry, you never told me there was a connection. There was no, nothing written in my ticket. I can't make it. They say, no, we want you to come regardless. We're going to send you a ticket via Europe. So then I go and uh, I flew from Rio to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam to Seoul. It was a connection in Amsterdam. And, uh, but they say with one condition, I, I supposed to go there for like a month. They say, we want you to stay for three months. I say, man, I'm a kid, right? Fresh out of college. I say, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm doing it. I want to experience things. Yeah. I want to see the world. I want to have uh, access to other cultures. And more than anything, I want to spread the 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 word of jiu-jitsu. I want people to learn that. And I was the first Brazilian to teach martial arts in Korea. Wow. So now when you were there, did you, did you open a Gracie Baja? No, there was a Hapkido slash Muay Thai school, they, they want to become a Grace Baja affiliate. So they go, they, I get, as soon as I get there, they put me in a nice hotel, they got a nice setup. And I noticed that, that there, were, there were some like uh, professional Thai boxers living in the school, some professional fighters living in the school. They had their own quarters, their own little bed, like sort of like Asian setup, like very humble, but man, I was waking up at 11, tired, you know, still adapting to the diet and everything. And then they were taking me to the school. I was training once a day. This lasts for a week. I say, look, cancel the, the hotel. They put me in a, like a nice, proper hotel. Cancel the hotel when I leave in the school. The guy, really? Yes, really, man. I want to be with this guy. Right. And, I, and then that was it. Waking up at 6 a.m., running around cell and training with these guys all the time doing like some kickboxing with them and training with anyone that would come to the school and then it became a all day long thing like i i love it yeah. you know and i had a, a great time you know oh wow. that's awesome. that was a great experience <laughs> yeah like that and yeah. Then from there after you spent three months there, you went back to brazil man that's this is an incredible story okay so i get back uh, I fly back to Amsterdam. When I get to Amsterdam, I go through the immigration, okay, to connect to my flight to have to pass the immigration. So on the line of the, like queuing to, to get to the passport check, 
my heart was already like tuk, 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 yeah. because of what happened to me in America. <laughs> yeah. I'm already panicking. I said, man, would they say something? And then as I, I get to I get to the passport control, there's a police officer in Amsterdam. He looks at my passport. He looks at me. He looks at my passport. He looks at me. He did like good that three or two or three times. He said, "Sir, where are you coming from?" I said, uh, "I'm coming. From, I'm coming from cell." He said, "Wait a minute." He t talks in Dutch on his radio. Two other guys come, and I say, "He say, where are your bags, sir?" I say, oh, "I believe they're uh, I, they're on the belt. I have to collect my bags on the luggage uh, claim." And I'm thinking like, this is it. Some way, somehow, they communicated with authorities in US. Yeah. They probably <laughs> think I'm a terrorist or I'm doing, I'm plotting something. I'm in trouble. Jesus Christ. That was too easy, too good to be true. Yeah. I'm in trouble again. And I'm thinking, I'm panicking, right? I'm getting like, feeling like my, getting hot, man. Right. My, my blood is like boiling. I say, what, what now, right? And then this uh, Dutch, Dutch police officer, one of the Dutch police officers pulls a magazine. Well, before my trip to, to Korea, it was when I made the finals on the World Championships of 2003. So there was a double page on a European magazine of me shoving this guy, like throwing this guy. And he recognized me from the picture, no from the way. name on the yeah. passport. So he gets me, he hands me the magazine in Dutch and say, please sign the picture. And, <laughs> and I say, God damn it, you don't know what you did. <laughs> well, uh, after that encounter with this guy, we became great friends, me and the police officer. And he came to Chicago a couple of years, a couple of years ago to train with me. That's he was awesome. A, he was a kickboxer and he runs like a, a CrossFit studio slash MMA. I'll show you guys. His name is Martin Man, who is a great friend of mine, incredible kickboxer, super nice guy. That's awesome. Yeah, we, yeah, we, 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 we went to Playa del Carmen together, uh -huh. you know, like I, I put up some camps there sometimes. Wow. And uh, we became friends for life. What a crazy way to make a friendship, you know? <laughs> I know. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, police officers, you know, they're so used to that, like, okay, can you hold on? And they yeah. don't realize they're in a uniform and then you're, like, <laughs> panicking. They're just like, hold on, sir. Let me wait. wait. Right, right. And they don't know what you're thinking. Because yeah. they're just like, hey, this guy is like, that's scary. Yeah, that's but I, I had an amazing. incident three months earlier, man. I was traumatized. Yeah. It's traumatizing, guys. I, I don't know if you ever went through something, like, no. similar to that. <laughs> but, but that's... I, I never had problems with authorities in my life. Right. I was always like a straight guy as an arrow, you know, like <laughs> always, never. But uh, that that was that was pretty scary, you know. Yeah. Like, so so I, now you got it in in Amsterdam, though. Now you're good, right? Yeah, right now you're, now you're, I'm good. Like, I, I got it. I got it sorted. But it was we, it was a great experience, you know. <laughs> the one uh, of Professor Mark was like years later. Right now I'm. I'm teaching in the UK, in the southwest of the UK. I was like a pioneer in jiu-jitsu over there. I was in school there. And I'm teaching like uh, this, like there are like, just within this team, there are like maybe seven or eight pride fighters, guys fighting for the pride within the same team. Oh, wow. And I was the, the first person to teach jiu-jitsu over there to this, to this team. So then like... Uh, Pride organized an event in Korea, and uh, they say, look, you got to come to coach some of the guys, and we're going to send you the ticket. We're going to come first because they have to be acclimated to the time change. And you're in school, you're going to come like a, a, a day before the press conference just to be with us on the press conference. and." It would be a good good way for you to get some connections there too because at the time i i did want to fight uh so they send me the ticket they say there will be someone with a card waiting for you and it's like three years almost passed in korea there will be someone waiting uh yeah in korea there will be someone waiting for you in the airport they're gonna get you in a shuttle they're gonna take you to the hotel you're gonna meet with us and everything gonna be fine okay so all I had was a ticket, no money, no, 
no address, no nothing. I just knew that someone would have my a card with my name. I mean, I have a, like a couple hundred dollars, but right, you know, as a college student, right. So I get to sell. I fly there from the UK and I get to sell. And uh, I was on one in the airport. I say, okay, they, they gotta be late. So I'll wait. 10 minutes, 20, one hour, two, three, four hours right now, I'm panicking. Thinking like, man, they forgot about me. <laughs> so I called the only number I had. And someone, they get someone to talk in English, they say the event got canceled. There's no one here. Jeez. And there is no one to pick you up. I say, what? <laughs> I'm going to stay here for a week. Where do I go? I say, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to try to find the school that I thought was. Right. So all I knew was the school was nearby the, the Olympic soccer stadium in Korea. That was all I knew. And then I, I get... Because you used to run around there. Yeah, uh, because to... I used to jog around with the oh, Thai, okay. Thai boxers. And so I get from a bus to a train, to a, 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 a subway, to another one. I know like two hours later, I get out of like this uh, the subway station and I look around, I see the, the soccer stadium down the road. And I'm st I had my two lug and my two suitcases and I'm looking around, I'm looking around, I'm walking around, man. And then I kind of recognize the place that I thought like years ago, nice. like, but no one's like, there was no one in the streets that could speak in English. There's the signs are in Korea. I, I, I can't read Korean at all. And then like, as I walk in the gym man, it was like a, a, a overwhelming experience because the whole, the whole gym was crowded. Everyone stopped. The whole gym, the, all the students, they bowed down. And I had the two suitcases and I'm like, <laughs> they couldn't believe that I was there. And I couldn't believe too, you know, it was one of them moments. Right. like whatever. Right. And then Professor Marcos comes walking like, what are you doing here? I say, I don't know. I need a place to stay. <laughs> Marcos from Crazy Baja Springfield. Yeah. Good, I guess you grew up with him. Yeah, like a great friend of mine. Oh, so, friend like randomly there. So oh, he was randomly there? Wow. Yeah, he had no clue. Yeah, oh. so I I ended up staying there with Professor Marco for a week and I fought in what was like the, like they say, man, that is like a, a national tournament. People from all over Korea are coming. I say, I mean it, sign yeah. me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I fought. A Jiu Jitsu? Yeah, oh. no gi. No gi? No gi. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, <laughs> so it was pretty cool. What about, uh, England, uh, did, were you, uh, were the Esteemer brothers out there at the time you were out there? Yeah, like, uh, and this is a, the other thing too, for anyone that is, they're at home making excuses uh, why they can get good in jiu-jitsu, there is not enough training for them. Well, a lot of people don't know, but Victor Stima, when he moved to the UK, he was a blue belt and Braulio was a purple belt. So it's uh they tra and when they were there training with their students they're all white belts how did these guys became so good man perseverance you know methods uh, uh, uh research coming to gracie baja learning from master carlos bringing that back home you know not some some people say ah, i don't want to train there because there are only white belts in that school well man i mean it's not the case of downers we have five black belts in down uh, in GB Downers like uh, on, the, on the mats of the GB Downers, but I I tell that to my students a lot. Man, sometimes you feel like you're not training. You think you don't have enough training partners. Shrimp and brothers, they they became like incredibly good training with white belts. You no, know? mm -hmm. I mean obviously they train a lot with Hoger too, but Hoger was no different when he moved to the UK. He was. I don't know, there were only a bunch of white belts in his school, and he wasn't a black belt himself. So did you go through the belts with Hoger? Like, do you remember him like on before black? Belt? I was one of his teachers. Really? Yeah, when he wow. was a yellow belt, Hoger trained under me for more than a year. Yellow belt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Crazy. And Hoger, I mean, I don't claim to be the one who made Hoger. Part of Hoger, his journey, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. definitely part of this journey, but like, uh, I I think like uh, Master Carlos has 
great contribution. You taught him that joke that he got Buchacha with, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think like uh, I remember Roger's father coming and say, Scorrega, please put energy on Roger, you know, uh, uh, try to, to teach him the fundamentals. I, I know you have like very good basic skills. Try to, you know, get him to understand because Roger was an athletic. He was a chubby kid. He was very shy, very quiet. So he wasn't the kid that anyone would think he would become what he became, you know. Uh, but he proved people to be wrong. Yeah. He's incredible, incredible guy too. Great, great, great uh, role model for jiu-jitsu. Very good Absolutely. person. I remember that match with Bushesha. Like he had one grip on his sleeve, but he was kind of holding it inward. And that grip ultimately served to be the back take like several steps later when they got to the ground. When I roll with you, there, there's a lot of these little grips, a lot of these little points that I don't, I don't feel with other people that, you know, you just have like, especially on the pack grips and in your guard passing, like I feel like, okay, I can maybe, no. You know, you, you, you always have like a, yeah, just a little grip, especially on the bottom of the pant, you do that really well too, in terms of uh, passing and just kind of keeping that and pushing that back, right? You know what I mean? That, that's like impossible to break. You try to like dig your hand under it and... Can't do that. Yeah, I think yeah. like uh, it's black belt it's, stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like ownership of the grip. Like you get that grip and right, it's, like, right. it's over. It's over yeah. because I it, know like yeah. this. This one thing, like uh, I was just talking to a student of ours yesterday during the study hall. He say, uh, "Well, where, where do you think it's it's my biggest gap in my jujitsu? I think it's lack of faith." And like uh, what I think, what a lot of black, the, what the black belts have in general, like. When you're a purple belt, pretty much you have the skills of a black belt. You know, it's just uh, when you're a purple belt, you're all, you're eighty percent of what a black belt will be. That's why you, people start paying attention on the purple belts. They're up and coming. Uh, these are the guys that are really going to be fighting. It's going to be they're going to be the best black belts in the world in years, few years to come. But. Uh, what I think sets a black belt apart is the faith in on their skills. You know, it's like trusting your skill. It's really important. And that's what I say to my student yesterday. I say, like, I think your biggest problem is having a little bit of more faith in your skills because he has some really good moves. Like many blue belts, many many white belts, they, they have good moves, but they, for, they tend to person tends to give up too early you know right and like you you get some you get a, a good black belt out there he will hold or she will hold until that until the very end until they get it because they know it will it will work yeah, so many times i thought to myself man if i could just break that grip i'll have something and that never pans out hey man you know Stop. I mean? like i i just know that <laughs> if, if i can get that grip on me you know what i mean so I like, was you know, was Hodger, um, did Master Carlos send Hodger to the UK, much like he sent you to to Saul? Or how did that work out? No, with with Hodger, it was like this. His father went to the UK first. Uh, Mauricio. Yeah, like Master Mauricio Gomez went to the UK first. Okay. And then, like, uh, Hodger eventually went to the UK to spend time with his dad. Was was that uh, a common thing that Master Carlos did? Was send out his students like like soldiers? Just you, you go to this country, you go here. Yes. Oh, like uh, I still I have a lot of uh, great memories of uh, my childhood over there in Greece, Baja. My my teenager days in Greece, Baja. They they really shaped my personality, and a lot of us. We're we're so heavily influenced by him. He has that that uh, hypnotizing personality, right. you know, when we were kids. And now, is this something that you guys were looking forward to coming up the ranks? I can't wait till I'm good enough to where Master Carlos will send me somewhere. Or were you afraid to? I don't want to leave Brazil. No, like it was like this. He was uh, he was always a, a, a visionary. A man ahead of his time, uh -huh. just like his father, just like Holes. It was one thing that uh, I think like uh, uh, we have to, to to attribute to the Graces. The Gracie family in general, they, they always were visionaries. They, they seen things ahead of 
of the rest of the world. <clears throat> and Master Carlos, he, just like his father, he believed that Jiu-Jitsu one day would be the greatest sport in the world, the biggest sport in the world. 25 years ago, this, for many, even many people in Brazil, uh, was sounding like uh, 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 ludicrous. He was like, a, the, he was called by many people as a megalomaniac. Because okay. they couldn't see. Right, right, right. But he could. So, when, uh, when the cat got out of the bag, you know, when you guys learn about the UFC, we started to have uh, foreigners coming to Brazil. And in every school they were going, they were getting beat up and sent back home. Like I, I heard the stories, man, this guy, this tough guy from Australia came over and got smashed and they sent him home. Oh, the guy from Spain showed up in such and so school and they beat the crap out of him and sent him back home. <laughs> And Master Carl was like, uh, we're kids back in the day. He said, look, this is all wrong. That's not the approach. There was a lot of uh, insecurity among the Brazilians that we want to retain jiu-jitsu because that's how we can conquer the world. Mm -hmm. That's how we can beat the rest of the world. If they never learn, we are, we're going to keep winning. Right. If there was an apocalypse and like you needed to survive and fight for resources, I mean, like, like you guys knew jiu-jitsu, but... Like, from being the best soccer players in the world right now, we are the best fighters in the world. Everything that we wanted, right? Yeah, like, right. With, a, with, with, a, with a martial arts, with a, the only martial art that has, like, a Brazilian identity. So, Brazilians, they want to, a lot of the Brazilian old school guys, they want to retain that. They sure. were against uh, 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 sharing the knowledge with foreigners. And Master Carlos and probably say, like the Chinese as well. When yeah, Bruce exactly. Lee, it's the same, exactly. same, type the same of story. Yeah. The yeah. same, the same mentality. Just like the Japanese yeah. before the Brazil. Mm -hmm. But Master Carlos say no. This is all wrong. The only way that we can expand jujitsu and the world can benefit from jujitsu and the art can grow and the, if all of us can become better is if everyone learns. So, what I want from you guys, and we're all, a lot of us were kids, I want you guys to start investing in learning different languages. Sign up on a German course, Spanish, Japanese, whatever. You gotta learn different languages because one day you guys are gonna be carrying the, the, the legacy of Gracie Baja across the world and gonna be expanding Jiu Jitsu for everyone. I, I remember these talks when I was a kid. I, I, I remember him like uh, uh, he was getting us on, on the mats. I mean, okay, everyone leaves. Only whoever wants to be a jiu-jitsu teacher one day stays. And then we would stay and he would just look at us and say, man, are we going to be scolded because we dare to stay? <laughs> you know, and, and he would have this sort of talks with us. Now, in, in so the other schools were beating the shit out of guys and sending them back to their country. Not, not I, I don't want to generalize. Yeah, you know, I don't want to be general, but the, uh, those let, were stories. That was the, that was the trend. Right. I wouldn't. I, I don't want to say there were a, a, other schools doing that. I want to say like there was more the trend. The right. idea was like we don't want to yeah. teach the foreigners. Even like uh, old school Gracie Baja guys, there 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 was that thing with when foreigners were coming, but right. Master Carlos, uh, uh, he really reprehended that. He, he didn't want that to happen in Greece, but he wanted jiu-jitsu to be shared for everyone. Mm -hmm. So in the event that somebody would come and visit Gracie Baja from a different country, would he want them to um, stay long enough to become good enough to be an affiliate back in his homeland? There wasn't so much a thought about official affiliations, you right. know. It was more of a because we are not a, like a we are not an international organization. But man, look, the early two thousands and late nineties, they were the golden years of Baja. It's like it's the cleanest, most beautiful, most well kept, best restaurants best schools best of everything of brazil was in that town there and we we're all there so 
or not, it was not rare, it was safe, you know, Brazil was, back in the day, that, that, that was the place to be, so uh, uh, you had a lot of people moving, uh, going there just for a camp, for a vacation, for a month, and wow, I'm gonna go back home, I'm gonna sell my TV, my car, give my dog away, and I'm, I'm moving down here. <laughs> so you had a lot of that over there. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, the Florian brothers, they, uh, they they spent a lot of time with me in Brazil. They used to stay in my house. Uh, BJ Penn used to hang out with me, uh, stayed in my house too back in his days in Gracie Barra. David Camarillo, a lot of the top guys like uh, Matt Sierra and his brother, they, they used to ride horses with me by my ranch. Oh, yeah. We, we did a lot of things together with guys that they, Amal Wilson, he moved to Brazil, spent a lot of time there. Even Pete the Greek. Is like a well-known Chicago guy. Yeah. Like Pete the Greek, like spent a good, uh, remember at least a good couple of years with us over there. And there are people that they went to spend a year and they're still there to this day. You know, they never came back. They had a, such a great time. Right. You know, so uh, it wasn't a, so much. That wasn't an idea of, okay, we're gonna branch out. We're gonna create this international organization. It was a natural course of things when we understood that in order to benefit others we have to create an, uh, a structure right so what is the um how does gracie baja as a as a whole feel about cross training good question it's not that uh we never had the need of the need of grace uh, of cross training within the gracie baja organization why Man, we have the best of the best right there. Yeah, the dream team. Yeah. The dream Enzo. team. Yeah, like the best within Enzo. our own network of professors there. We had the best of the best. You go to school to school all within Gracie Baja. Yeah. Right. So in, it, in essence, it, that you could cross train between each other because you so many, so many exactly. schools. Right? So okay. that, it, it, like, it, it was like that back in, in the day in Brazil because you had an incredible team of incredible professors <laughs> and they're all under Master Carlos and they all uh, 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 had the same idea of what, how jiu-jitsu should be taught, what we should do. So you could cross train within your own entity there. We never felt the need of like hopping from schools to schools. But I think nowadays, the idea, it's more like uh, jiu-jitsu is being diluted and, 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 uh, and uh, each school, they, they, they teach whatever they want or whatever they think it, it is right. And for us, it's a challenge to keep uh, uh, our teachings and the, the philosophies of his father and himself alive not diluted, right. just like the in the original it. school. Mm -hmm. So the only way to do that is if we keep the, all the ideas aligned with our students. Mm -hmm. right. That's what we believe to be right. right. You think that other schools are kind of compromising the purity of what they intended jujitsu to be? Not other schools, but some schools, some professors, they just teach what they are good at. Mm -hmm. Right. They just te teach what they think it's it's uh, 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 jujitsu should be like. Well, I'm teaching what my master taught me and what his father taught him. And then maybe you should clarify that what you mean by cross training, because now I, you know when I think about cross training, because I look at it like more of like an open mat situation. Kind of you know, like I'm yeah, not, I go I'm not visit. going to another school to like take classes. I mean, I, I I don't think I've ever really done. But I'll go to like you know on a weekend, maybe I'll head over to New Breed or name school and you know i was at kern's for his open mat you know mm -hmm. and it, you know just getting different bodies different feels of you know what their jujitsu is like and, and kind of like train for the day yeah that's yeah. it you know just an open mat on a saturday or a sunday whatever it is you know how, do you, feel, how feel. do you feel about something like that here's the way i feel man it's so hard to get uh our students to understand the importance of uh of uh, our uniform etiquette, or how a class should be, how you should operate in class. You know, uh, you never swear to a training partner, you, you never smash the walls, or you never smash the floor. It's very respectful. You know, yeah. it's, it's, so, it's so hard 
to educate them, to get to understand these things that is so important for the well-being of training. If you can keep a positive energy on the mats, you can go harder, longer, and you can sustain that. You can endure that for years. Therefore, you grow. Right. I, well, totally, I totally understand what you're coming from. With that. Yeah. that makes sense. So then you get a, 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 a white belt kid doesn't know much he goes and train down the road down the street where man it's a mad house it's arms broken you know a pinky gi with like a black top you know and like <laughs> i do have a you pinky, know so. the, not, the not message organized. yeah not organized so the message there may not or some schools are even organized in a certain way but their message is not ours right so okay, maybe it's a competition only or maybe they will say well we don't compete over here it's self-defense only jiu-jitsu is self-defense and my students see me teaching competition oh. training there so right now he's confused so he say let me move to the next one to see it's more aligned with my professor so who's right you know it's that that story uh there are two guys arguing on the street over the uh, flag waving against the, the wind. Well, it's the flag, one arguing that it's the flag waving against the wind. And the other one saying, no, it's the wind waving against the flag. Mm -hmm. So who's right? You know, it's that confusion. There, it's, there, there isn't a simple answer who's right and who's wrong. But we believe we, if we want to keep uh the lineage pure for grace Baha. we want to keep the the teachings of master carlos legit we're just vehicles it's not so much uh me it's what he wants for jiu-jitsu in the grace Baha schools because he can't be in 700 schools around the world mm -hmm. but us we can represent what he wants for jiu-jitsu therefore we, we we want our students to to be aligned with that vision. It's not, I always tell my students, look guys, it's not that I'm afraid to lose a student. You know, I'm not afraid to lose a student. I believe if you're not happy in a place, you shouldn't be there because you compromise the atmosphere of the entire, the entire team. Right. That person who always miserable on the mats, man, it's the worst person you can have in your group. You don't yeah. want that guy there. Right. Yeah. You want everyone to be happy, to people that share the same objective, the same ideas, the same, the same vision, so everyone grows. Yeah. Right. So, therefore, like uh, uh, I tell the guys, if you one day not happy to be here, no problem, as long as you respect me, I respect you. you, you can go and maybe find another team, that's fine. If you think this is not for you, you know, I, I have my own style to do things, which is based on what my teacher does and what he did to me. If you're not happy, no problem. I, I totally respect that. It's not that you are a bad person. It's right, just right. like maybe the message is not for you. Yeah. But uh, uh, if you, if you want to, I mean, if you want to be part of that, man, it, it has to be that way. You know, you want to test yourself with other teams, boy, that's why we go and compete. Yeah. You know, we go there to test ourselves, to fuel others. Like the guy competing against you also, is, he's not your enemy, it's just your personal test, you know. So you can go there and still be friends. And uh, Andrea Maneco, for instance, I, I have no problems with that guy. I talk to Professor Maneco, we laugh and... You know, he hates me when I'm coaching and he's <laughs> the referee because he knows I'm really intense. I, I'm really passionate about my students. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a little taste yeah. of his own medicine. Right. I wouldn't yeah. feel too fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't feel sorry for Manek. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we don't, it's, and I have a lot of great friends like in, in, in throughout the, 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 yeah. the jiu-jitsu community. I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. That, that makes total sense. It makes total sense. Yeah. And you know, nothing infuriates me more than when you're at a competition and you hear somebody say like, oh, we're going to we're going to fucking destroy this guy or we're going to, you know, but I, that guy, that is you. <laughs> He's on the same journey you're on. You guys are fighting for the same thing. You're trying to beat your demons and become the best version of yourself that that guy is trying to do the exact same thing that you're doing and you're going to go and sharpen each other up even more. Right there. I, I never understood that 
we're gonna kill him and you know no, this right. is yeah i hate not, that that it's, is you and i hear that i hear that at competition yeah. sometimes yeah that's that's weird not so much um in the ibjjf but in other trashier uh tournaments <laughs> i would say <laughs> yeah. yeah like uh I, I i just disconnected myself completely from from some tournaments out there and i i, I pull my students out i say guys Okay, we are we are not IBJJF and fa uh, fanatics that we can only compete in IBJJF. But I want to make sure, you know, there are decent referees. There, there, there are some. There, there is an ambulance outside. There's standards. There's standards. The tournament mm -hmm. you you're gonna compete when you're supposed to. It was a tournament a couple of years ago in Chicago. I took a student of mine. He was 14. He was a teenager. Like, uh, Tony Russo. Uh, it's, it's, you you watch out for this kid. He's, He's an now. up and coming kid. He's incredible, tactical, so, tactical, and and he he is the portrait of a Gracie Barra guy. You look at that guy. You, you you It's how it's supposed to be. You know, extremely respectful, polite, good takedowns. Nice hair. <laughs> real sick, like, Amazing real well, guard. Well put together. Yeah, he is like always look. He looks the 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 real deal. He is real deal. So. I got this kid over there, the nicest kid in the world, like wants to challenge himself, wants to compete. And they throw him against a 21 year old kid, man. Like I say, kid got smashed, obviously. He doesn't have any strength. Yeah. It, you know, what, what happened? What, what was that, guys? Oh, no. It's, it's, it's the, only, the, the only person for him to compete. I say, did you ask his parents? Did you ask me? How can right. you put a grown man to compete with a kid, you right. know, like, uh, it, it was a good experience for Tony, you know, but uh, it's not what I want for my students. Right. I, I, I don't want to, like, uh, I don't want to uh, 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 get them to be the champions of an aquarium, no, but I, I want them to have fair matches, right. fair rules, fair refereeing, you know, fair fights. Yeah. Now, let me ask you something about, you know, as far as Gracie Baja goes, it's always very you know respect is taught on the mat and it's a requirement so when you see a guy like aj agazarm for instance the way he's perceived in the community with his mouth and you know even the way he loses he'll lose a match and say oh the rules are stupid yeah, just goes off on instagram or something you know does that yeah. does that bother you and i love that you asked that question yeah. i had my own bit of like a of uh of uh of aj i called him out because i really want to kick his butt uh -huh. you know and uh thanks god nothing happened you know because uh I, something like that can get you in trouble over here in america but i had my own bit with that guy i think he doesn't uh uh, uh portrait gracie bar I, I don't think he represents gracie bar he fights for Gracie Bar. I don't think he represents Gracie Bar. But he was on the edge to be kicked out of Gracie Bar more than once. Master Carlos called him out and, like, you know, uh, really blasted him, like, more than once, twice. And, and uh, Draculino did that once, too. And I think that helped him a lot. It, like, it's, like, uh, 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 it would be a much worse case if they, he wouldn't have that 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 sort of like uh, 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 pillars to look up to. Like we never, we, it's not that we are cool with that. It's right. that he is like surviving up to now. I don't know if he will stay with Gracie Baja forever. I hope to, and I hope he matures as well. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I personally, I mean, I don't hate him. I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna, do anything bad against him but it's i dislike him because in my opinion he doesn't represent grace bar not the way we would like to be represented right right you know right yeah that yeah, makes sense i mean dylan dylan danis right he got kicked out of marcelo's marcelo's team, team. Yeah. you know but one. you know you got guys like felipe pena you know <clears throat> aj i think is on this He's on this mindset of I need to be like Gordon Ryan and Conor McGregor and be kind of a mouthpiece in order to 
to get popularity and to get matches and become high profile on Instagram and this and that. But you got a guy like Felipe, who's just as popular. Mm -hmm. And he is he's a, even he's arguably the best grappler in the world. Right now he is, yeah. yeah. Why not just take that road? Yeah. Well, man, personalities, like personalities. Because he's, AJ's not even good at being like a character. G Gordon yeah. accepted like his loss against AJ. Like he only has, has good things to say after the match. You know, AJ lo loses a match and just like makes all these excuses. Yeah. He says all these things. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, I, I think uh, AJ is a very immature yeah. You know, I think uh, I hope he he matures and he learns because, look, guys, twin, uh, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I was Rafa Mendes. I was João Miao. I was the real deal. Right. You know, I was the top like guy, like feather guy, super feather guy in the world. I was among the top three for years yeah you know was the guy that people knew that if i would show up it would get it would get super you know it yeah, would yeah. Be a, you gotta it would see be a hot match. match see him before a match he's like ah, and uh he just gets pumped but this all passed master carlos says medals they get rusty you know and uh is that the legacy you want to you want to bring with you for the rest of your life is that how you like to be remembered no, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I really hope AJ matures and he he mend his ways, because I, I I don't think he's a bad guy. I just I, I just think he's immature. He's stupid. Yeah. But uh, life life teaches great lessons. Right. So, uh, what about you? You when's the last time you competed? Uh, last year. Okay. Yeah. I, and what competition was that? I competed in the Chicago. I I won gi and no gi. Nice, you know. And uh, and I competed in the Pan Ams. I won all my matches to the final day. And uh, uh, I just like had a, like a little twist on my knee and it swelled up. And I was coming off a of surgery. I say, you know, I I'm gonna take it easy. I'm not gonna continue. So I had like a. a I stopped on the semifinal, so I, I made the podium, but uh, I didn't. I didn't compete for the last day, just the yeah. first day. It was fun, yeah. you know. Nowadays, I don't compete for myself. I compete for for him, for my students, right. and and for my kids. You know, I I I don't compete for myself. Like I I love to compete, but I have greater responsibilities with my students, with uh, my seminars. So I, I do love to compete. I'm a natural uh, uh, competitive, competitive person. I was just like uh, going on match after match on FIFA 2018 with my son and he kicks my butt on every <laughs> single game on Xbox. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even know how to play that, but I keep telling him, man, when I know what these buttons means, watch because they're gonna kick your butt. <laughs> so I'm a naturally competitive person. Is your son in jiu-jitsu? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's like eight, right? Yeah. yeah. I remember yesterday at study hall, like you were rolling with him a bit and I, you know, he knows like some judo throws, he knows nice. he's good jiu-jitsu, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so uh, I asked him and I knew, I knew the answer was yes before I asked, but I'm like, hey, do uh, you know the Osotogari? And he's like, Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got put in my place, man. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know that. Like, it's a classic. Of course he knows it. <laughs> I, I saw, I saw, I, being a, like a teacher in Jiu Jitsu for so long, I saw uh, miracles unfolding uh, right in front of my very eyes many times. And uh, one of the miracles is it's, it's my very daughter. She was very shy, insecure, quiet. Man, she's a, such an incredible, inspiring young girl, you know, talkative, happy. You know, it was, it was like jujitsu helped to, to flourish her personality in a, such an amazing way. And we see that it, every day, yeah. like, you know. So uh, I, I think it's a, a great thing for kids. I'm very thankful that my kids, they, they can train, you know, uh, a couple times a week and that's uh, all that's I great. want for them. That's, great. that's awesome. And, and this is the, the other thing I, I talk a lot to our students to say, look guys, 
you want to do jiu-jitsu for life, not for the next medal. You know, it's like survive the hour, survive the class, survive the day, survive the week, survive the month, survive the camp. Very important. Many don't. Survive the tournament, survive the year, survive the path. This is what you want for you in jiu-jitsu, to be to be blessed enough to one day that you can be training with your kids and maybe with your grandkids. Great Grandmaster Carlos Gracie Sr. died at the age of 94, if I'm not mistaken, and he wore his gi a week before he passed in his sleep. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. That's what I want for me. I don't want to be like a crippled football player that was an absolutely stud on his like 20s and by his 40s like mid 30s he's all crippled and can't do anything i want to endure jiu-jitsu i want to be able to play jiu-jitsu for my whole life mm -hmm. because i enjoy doing it. and i want to do it with kenzo and akemi i think other sports like you know maybe maybe and this is just like i'm just saying generalization but you know those those professional athletes who you know, they're really good at their 20s. Yeah. And then they're so used to that regimen of being a pro athlete and constantly training. And then they get, they retire and then they, you know, they put on some weight. They don't do so much training and they get, you know, they look totally different. I mean, I'm not going to call anyone out in particular, but, you know, we see guys in commercials now and they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> kind of let himself go. What happened? Right. But where you have jujitsu, we're not going to stop. There's no retirement <laughs> for jujitsu. I mean, you're going to be doing this till, yeah, Hopefully. like you said. Till, till, till we, till we yeah. die, so, you know what I mean? And we're always going to be in that in that shape, you know? It's nice. And you have to have discrimination of how you train, you know, to, to be able to do that for your whole life. If you want to jiu-jitsu for life, you have to have a, li a, a, a lifelong plan, like we talk about a lot, mm -hmm. you know, a lifelong plan for that. You can't just go on a rampage. You, you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you will be forced to, to retire. What's amazing is there, you decided to go and become full-time uh, teaching around the world, like in the prime of your competitive career, right? So you, you won a world championship and you got second the next year. Then you start to go around the world. So sometime, you know, in your mid-20s, in mid-20s, I mean, this is where people might compete a lot. So you could, I mean, just as easily have another few world titles. But instead, you know, you've opened schools around the world, which I think is in itself, like, pretty oh, badass. Yeah. Awesome. Man, but it, it, better than a medal. But if yeah. if you but, see, like it, it didn't happen to me only. It happened to to a lot of the black belts that that came from Master Carlos. It happened to to Half Grace. It happened to Hanzo. Hanzo kept uh, competing, kept, uh, but it happened to it happened to Draculino, man. It's exactly the same thing. I remember when I, when I started Jiu Jitsu, Draculino was like a purple belt. <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, it happened to him. He he moved to Belo Horizonte to be a teacher at his prime. You know he could he could he could compete much more. That's what I'm trying to say. But like uh, it's that idea ingrained that when when you're a carrier of, of this flame, you have to pass to others and you have to enlighten people and enlighten the world. We, I'm totally believe that is like a, a moral and a spiritual obligation to every jiu-jitsu practitioner, you know, to to enlighten other people and to to share that with others. You know, yeah. absolutely, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. What's wrong? Why are you Nothing, like man. That? It's great. I'm just inspired. It's mesmerizing, you know? yeah. right? <laughs> It's what great. about Master Worlds? Are we going to see at Master World any any of these upcoming years? Yeah, I I, I won in two thousand and fifteen. Oh, Master nice. Worlds. Yeah, uh, I want to do it again. I I I mean I I'm the guy that hates to make plans. I, I what weight are you now? Feather, uh, feather, feather. Yeah, yeah, feather. I fluctuate. Depends. In Chicago, it's hard to to have masters uh, feather weight. So I sometimes I I fight on the adult or I fight at the lightweight. lightweight. So huh? I fluctuate between feather and, and lightweight. But yeah, I feel I feel really good at featherweight. I feel like great to train at lightweight, but I feel really good at featherweight. No more super feather. That was the, my days at super <coughs> feather were gone. What, what is super? What is what super feather? It was like a one one thirty five, like maybe one one thirty nine. They don't have that anymore, do they? Yeah, I think they just got light feather. They light, call it. Uh, light feather, light, light feather. That's what I fight. I fight light feather. <laughs> yeah, one one forty one in the gi. Yeah, one forty one. I light. walk around like 
I walk around like 133, 134. Yeah. I don't have to cut any weight. That's yeah. just my natural. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good weight. Yeah. Not yeah. a lot of people in that weight though. At my no. age, yeah. not a lot. <laughs> Although I did the guy at Master Worlds, uh, Gracie Baja guy won it all. Real good guy. Samuel Braga. Uh, no, at at my weight class, blue belt. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he, yeah, he's he was tough, man. I talked to his wife when he was competing. I got I lost my first match, and he fought the guy that I lost to. He was that that guy was well. He was really, a judo black belt. Yeah, yeah. He's probably he had so, some, he had some type of yeah. I think he had some type of yeah. background, but yeah, man, he was freaking good. <laughs> he was not messing around. It was really. I wanted to compete against him. I didn't get a chance to, but just the guy I went against was super tough too. But um, but yeah, it was a different, totally different competition level of competition than I'm used to. Um, it was it was good. It was you really know, good. like uh, uh, I remember when I was a kid, Master Carlos would come and say, "Look, you now you're the Gracie kids. You go there to the tournaments. You know something they don't, and you win it. But look, that would be a day." that everyone gonna know jiu-jitsu and they're gonna have good knowledge too so if you don't do your homework if you don't practice judo if you don't do what it takes if you don't become well-rounded if you don't learn like how to pass how to defend how to do close guard how to do open guard if you guys don't study jiu-jitsu as a science you're gonna get eaten alive it's true today they're they're like uh they're not only the, the, the Gracie-related schools are good in competition. You have guys, they're, they're known, they, they don't belong to the Gracie lineage, they're jiu-jitsu, and they're incredible. Mm -hmm. you know, they're really yeah. good. And You know, the knowledge they're is out really there. Good. and Almost yeah. like, I was going to ask from this cross-training perspective, it used to be kind of from a technical perspective too, right? You want to keep the techniques within a school or a camp. You know, you don't, you don't want that to spread. But now do you think that's changed with the internet, with DVDs? Yeah. You know, everyone's secrets are out there if you yeah. search yeah. hard enough. That is, that is no way to to hide uh, 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 techniques anymore. I, right. I think it's out there for everyone. But uh, I don't think like uh, a lot of things you, you learn in, jiu in a jiu-jitsu school uh, that only your teacher can teach you. You know, you're not going to learn in a DVD. You're not going to learn in a competition. They're, they're, they're mindsets. You know, their philosophies, their yeah. their own things that only, you know, your first hand teacher. experience. Yeah. On that note, like, I want to compliment Anthony because, like, I rode with you a couple of weeks ago, and you know, the first time I rode with you was like three years ago. Remember, like, Ten Planet. Yeah. And just to see the development from, you know, every time we would roll, and then you know, you started at Maneko's, and to see the change in poise and composure. You know, the techniques have always evolved. You know, I've seen him, and he started doing gi fairly recently yeah. about a year ago about a year yeah. ago about a year ago and you know this speaks to my neck he must be i mean i've never rolled with him i know him in passing a little bit but i mean he's he, yelled at you before yeah he's yelled, yeah, yeah as yeah. a ref yeah but it, it was just standard ref coach <laughs> right sta type of stuff but you know what did he do he ran out on the mat and told you to take your referee shirt i off? made the right call okay <laughs> <laughs> i made the right call it was his guy that it was against because his guy was screaming ah, ah, ah yeah. verbal tap yeah his foot was breaking. i'm just messing with you Absolutely. keep going <laughs> anyways we can get into that but i mean he must be you know a good instructor because anthony you know since he started doing gi and then just a couple weeks ago just feeling the difference and then seeing the difference in you you didn't have you know you weren't frazzled you weren't like it was just a random open mat you know you weren't uh like right. affected by shoulder by like shoulder pressure or neon belly you know and you, you can see this in someone who's like you can get in their head a little bit if you get that neon belly if you see yeah if you got it but like this was like stone cold was a big, big hump you know what i mean so, yeah like uh when when Jesus. you when you get to that point it, it and then like uh you can start like uh incorporate it one of like uh the biggest lessons jiu-jitsu can teach you which is like man you can endure more than you think you can you know we're stronger than we can possibly think we are we learn that every day on the mats and and, and that can be applied in life if you look in people with secular careers but they're active uh, jiu-jitsu practitioners they always excel in what they do in their fields they tend to 
to to shine more than others it's because like we learn incredible life lessons on the mats every day and one of them it's like never give up yeah you know yeah and Just, on that note <laughs> it's a beautiful way to end to it never yeah, give it up. We really appreciate you coming out, and uh, maybe we can. We can, are we gonna put the gi on after this? I hear you it? got an amazing esteem lock. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you maybe do it on Anthony? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, All right. Yeah. Good. <laughs> thanks, yeah, Bob. You guys. You guys. Fucking learn something. Yeah. yeah awesome. Like, uh, and thanks, Armand. Thanks for yeah. putting this together for us. Yeah. yeah thanks for really letting me hitchhike and yeah. yeah, come along for the ride. And where fan. can uh, where can people find you? Where's your uh... www dot gb downers grove com we are right off uh uh we're right on ogden avenue in downers uh anyone is welcome to really like come and check us out like that the, the school like it's open to anyone who wants to try a class just give us a call come and well you're gonna you're gonna have a good time there for sure it's uh uh it would be a pleasure to have anyone to come in and check us out you know yeah. like uh have you found your animal yet I, man, so he's, I school hey guys uh nickname means slippery right and we, we've been having this thing about like what what's your jujitsu animal you know uh -huh. trying i was i want to suggest a cobra <laughs> that's a great a animal cobra. for him or, or a rattlesnake i think a rattlesnake <laughs> would be more appropriate because he can be very explosive but he also can okay here's the thing and i don't know if you if you learned this one from me yet but if not you will learn today for the first time ever I can be called a cobra because the cobras or rattlesnake they're only striking animals they're only fast yeah okay so i get a lot of students from lack of faith they give up on chokes and i tell them guys no uh in the animal kingdom all the choking animals they take their time choking their prey. a lion when it chokes a uh, 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 gazelle a gazelle it takes time yeah you know he stays on that throat over there until he choke the animal unconscious uh an anaconda takes like a few hours to to choke an animal so she can eat it that's why it's like, a snake though rattlesnake is just related to the but, anaconda but you have that explosiveness but so it's, but it's both. but uh the striking snakes they're really fast therefore your locks should be like a striking snake like your chokes your choke like like a, a cobra your locks oh yeah okay your locks right because locks they're strike they have to you have to have an element of speed Sap. yeah and your chokes they should be like uh a boa constrictor snake okay mm -hmm. so <laughs> you, you can't go. only be fast in jiu-jitsu but you can't also only be slow you have to have a little bit of both right. to change speeds to break off the beat uh -huh. you know uh yeah there you go that's so we're gonna go with rattlesnake <laughs> i don't i don't i'm not a snake i'm pretty loyal anymore you know a serpent <laughs> yeah, i'm a bottom blower uh, i don't know like uh uh i think i would be a canine you know canine. the canine because i Smart have dogs. a great sense of community you know and like i'm a i'm like a i have this tribal thing like uh you're loyal uh, yeah You're like to loyal. my to my people to my friends you know Skip like point. i'm i'm over there for like i'm the kind of guy that once i become friends with someone man i uh, i'll i'll move mountains for that person you know? like yeah. I, I believe in that boundary of friendship between yeah. people so i think like uh the canine is in general they're, they're like that i think we have more of uh of canines maybe wolves in us than we have uh, uh uh of primates you know in many different ways and that's why uh over 50 60 thousand years ago we were able to to form like maybe even more we're formed this this incredible bond between us as humans and canines yeah interesting yeah possibly yeah why not <laughs> <laughs> are my working people find you uh, I'm on Instagram at Real Armin Hammer. Also, you can go on Facebook, find me on Facebook. Yeah, I'm on Instagram too. Carlos oh, Le Carlos Lemos Jr. GB. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Great. All right. Appreciate you uh, coming out and listening. Talk to you guys later. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye. Thank you. Jiu-jitsu. 
Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. For more information about Grappler Union Podcast, you could visit us at our website at grapplerunion.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Grappler Union. Please like us on Facebook. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And all of our episodes are available on our YouTube channel. Say what? Be sure, be sure to subscribe. Yeah, subscribe to all that shit. <laughs> um, you got to do another take, right? Oh. This episode of the Grappler Union Podcast is brought to you by BJJTs. Go to BJJTs.com, enter the promo code GRAPPLERUNION, and save 10% off all your jiu-jitsu apparel. Go to BJJTs.com today. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Strict9 Jiu-Jitsu, makers of vintage-inspired tees, hoodies, and rash guards. Go to Strict9.co, that's S-T-R-Y-C-H, the number 9, dot co, and use the promo code UNION at checkout to receive 20% off your online order.